Hello there, my fellow star gods, and welcome to my brand new initiative for covering another Xenos race apart from the orcs. And by another, I do mean the cold and badass looking Necrons. Fun fact, the Necrons are actually my favorite Xenos race from Warhammer 40k, at least as far as appearance goes. In case you're worried I'll stop doing orc videos, that is not the case, since I will just alternate between them and Necron lore videos. That being said, I've already done a video on the Necrons some time ago, so if you watch that, you do have some idea of who and what they are. In today's episode, I will expand on that sense of identity and talk about how their deities, the Catan, came into being. I will also talk about the race which would eventually become the Necrons before they turn themselves into metal killing machines. And finally, about the events known as the Wars of Secession and the War in Heaven. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn some Necron history, shall we? The birth of the entities known as the Star Gods occurred at the same time as the moment of creation itself, as they formed from the vast insensate energies first unleashed by that churning mass of cataclysmic force. Long before the planets had formed and cooled, the very first truly aware sentient beings emerged, their thoughts encased within the lines of force produced by the plasma and electromagnetic flares of the stars themselves. In later times, these entities would become known as the Catan, but early in their existence, they were nothing like the malevolent beings they would eventually become. They were little more than monstrous energy parasites that suckled upon the solar energies of the stars that had brought them into existence, shortening the lives of otherwise main sequence stars by millions of years. In time, these star vampires learned to move on the diaphanous wings of the universe's electromagnetic flux, leaving their birthplaces to drift through the cosmic ether to new stellar feeding grounds, and begin the cycle of stellar destruction once again. Beings of pure energy, they paid no mind to the hunks of solid matter they passed in the vacuum of space. The blazing geothermal fires and weak geomantic fields of those nascent planets insufficient to be worth feeding even their ravenous hunger. The humanoid species that would become the Necrons began their existence under a fearsome scourging star in the far reaches of the galaxy known as the Halo Stars region, billions of years before mankind evolved on Terra. Assailed at every moment by ionizing solar winds and intense radiation storms, the flesh and blood Necrontyr became a morbid people, whose precarious lifespans were riven by constant loss. What little information the Imperium has recovered about the Necrontyr tells that their lives were short and uncertain, their bodies blighted and consumed at an early age by the terrible cancers and other illnesses linked to the high levels of radiation given off by their sun. Necrontyr cities were built in anticipation of their inhabitants' early demise, as the living were only brief residents living in the shadow of vast sepulchres and tombs of their ancestors. Likewise, their ruling dynasties were founded upon the anticipation of demise, and the living were thought to be no more than temporary residents hurrying through the more permanent and lasting structures raised to honor the dead. On the Necrontyr homeworld, the greatest monuments were always built for the dead, not for the living. Driven by necessity, the Necrontyr escaped their crucible prison, hoping to carve out an empire in which they could realize the potential of their species. The Necrontyr blindly groped outward into the universe to explore distant stars. Using stasis scripts and slow-moving antimatter-powered torch ships, the Necrontyr began to colonize distant worlds. Little by little, the Necrontyr dynasties spread out even further, until much of the ancient galaxy answered to their rule. 
from the earliest days, the rulers of individual Necrontier dynasties were themselves governed by the Triarch, a council composed of three Phaerons. I am actually uncertain if it is Triarch or Triarch, but if I'm mistaken, do feel free to correct me. The head of the Triarch was known as the Silent King, for he addressed his subjects only through the other two Phaerons who ruled alongside him. Nominally a hereditary position, the uncertain lifespans of the Necrontyr ensured that the title of Silent King nonetheless passed from one royal dynasty to another many times. The final days of the Necrontyr Empire occurred in the reign of Sarek, the last of the Silent Kings. Sometime during their slow expansion, the Necrontyr encountered an ancient species even older than themselves. Collectively, they were known only as the Old Ones, and they were absolute masters of forms of energy that the Necrontyr could not even conceive of, yet alone wield. The Old Ones had long ago conquered the secrets of immortality, yet they refused to share this gift of eternal life with the Necrontyr, who yet bore the curse of the distant star that they were born under. The colonization of much of the galaxy by the reptilian mystics had been immeasurably swifter and more expansive than that of the Necrontyr, because of their warp gates and mastery of the Immaterium. That, and the Old Ones' incredibly long, if not downright immortal lifespans, kindled a burning, jealous rage in the Necrontyr. They were astonished to learn that another intelligent species enjoyed such long lives while their own were so brutally short. But, as time wore on, even more strife came to the Necrontyr. Each dynasty sought to claim its own destiny, and soon the Great Houses were engaged in an all-out conflict known as the Wars of Secession. Had circumstances remained as they were for just one more generation, it is possible that the Necrontyr might have wiped each other out, as so many species had before them and shall do in the future. As their territory grew wider and more diverse, the unity that had made them strong had eroded, and bitter wars were waged as entire realms fought to win independence. Ultimately, the Triarch, realized that the only hope of unity lay in conflict with another race. But there were very few of those who could pose a credible threat. Only the Old Ones, the first of all the galaxies known sentient species, were a foe powerful enough to bind even the feuding dynasties together. Such a war was simplicity itself to justify, for the Necrontyr had ever rankled at the Old One's refusal to share the secrets of eternal life. So did the Triarch declare war on the Old Ones. At the same time, they offered amnesty to any secessionist dynasties who willingly returned into the fold. Thus, lured by the spoils of victory and the promise of immortality, the separatist realms of the Necrontyr abandoned their wars of secession and the war in heaven began. The horrible wars between the Old Ones and the Necrontyr that followed, known later in Eldar myth as the War in Heaven, could fill many libraries in their own right. But the Necrontyr could never win. Their superior technology was constantly outmaneuvered by the Old Ones, thanks to their mastery of the webway portals and warp gates. The Necrontyr were pushed back until they were little more than an irritation to the Old Ones' dominance of the galaxy, a quiescent threat clinging to their irradiated world, exiled and forgotten. But in the face of defeat, the always fragile unity of the Necrontyr began to fracture once again, no longer did the prospect of a common enemy have any hold over the disparate dynasties. Scores of generations had now lived and died in the service of an unwinnable war, and many Necron dynasties would have gladly sued for peace with the Old Ones if the ruling Triarch had permitted it. Thus begun the second iteration of the Wars of Secession, even more widespread and ruinous than any that had come before. So fractured did the Necrontyr dynasties became by then, that had the Old Ones been inclined, they could have wiped them out with ease. 
Faced with the total collapse of their rule, the Triarch searched desperately for a means of restoring order. In this endeavor, their prayers were answered, though the price for their whole species would be incalculably high. It was during the reign of the Silent King Sarek that the godlike beings known as the Catan first blighted the Necrontyr. It is impossible to say for certain how the Necrontyr first made contact with the Catan, though many misleading, contradictory, and one-sided accounts of these events exist. The dusty archives of the Tomb World of Solemnus claim it was a simple accident, a chance discovery made by a stellar probe during the investigation of a dying star. The Book of Mournful Night, held close under guard in the Black Library's innermost sanctum, tells rather how the raw hatred that the Necrontyr held as a race for the Old Ones sang out across space, acting as a beacon that the Catan could not ignore. Another account claims that from the earliest days of their civilization, Necrontyr scientists had been deeply engaged in stellar study, to try to understand and protect themselves from their own sun's baleful energy. After long, bitter centuries of searching for some power to unleash upon the Old Ones, the Necrontyr researchers used stellar probes to discover unusual anomalies in the oldest dying stars of the galaxy. Here, they found a sentience that was more ancient than any of the corporeal species in creation, including the Old Ones. They had discovered entities of pure power that had spawned during the birth of the stars eons before. These entities had little conception of what the rest of the universe entailed when the Necrontyr first found them, instead simply feeding upon the solar flares and magnetic storms of these bloated red giants. The power of these starborn creatures was incredible, the raw energy of the stars made animate, and the Necrontyr called them the Catan, or star gods in their own language. The Catan were dispersed across areas larger than whole planets, their consciousness too vast for humanoids to comprehend. How the Necrontyr ever managed to communicate with them is unknown to the Adeptus Mechanicus. Understanding that such diffuse minds could never perceive the material universe without manifesting themselves in a material form, some Necrontyr actively sought the Catan's favor, and oversaw the forging of physical shells for the Catan to occupy. These were cast from the living metal known as Necrodermis. Thus clad, the Catan took the shapes of the Necrontyr's half-forgotten gods hiding their own desires beneath a cloak of subservience. Incomprehensible forces were compressed into the living metal of the Necrodermis bodies, which the Necrontyr had forged as the full power of the Catan at last found form. As they focused their consciousness and became ever more aware of their new mode of existence, they came to appreciate the pleasures available to beings of matter. The deliciously focused trickles of electromagnetic power given off by the physical bodies of the Necrontyr awakened a new hunger in the Catan, very different from the one they were used to. So it was that one of the Catan came before the Silent King, Zarek, acting as forerunner to the coming of his brothers. Among his own kind, this Catan was known as the Deceiver, for it was willfully treacherous. Yet the Silent King was ignorant of the Catan's true nature, and instead granted the creature an audience. The Deceiver spoke of a war, fought long before the birth of the Necrontyr, between the Catan and the Old Ones. It was a war, he said, that the Catan had also lost. In the aftermath, and fearing the vengeance of the Old Ones, he and his brothers had hidden themselves away hoping one day to find allies with whom they could finally bring the Old Ones to account. In return for this aid, the Deceiver assured, he and his brothers would deliver everything that the Necrontyr craved. Unity could be theirs once again, and the immortality that they had sought for so long would finally be within their grasp. The Deceiver insisted that there would be no price to be paid for these boons for they were simple gifts to be bestowed upon valued allies. Thus did the Deceiver speak, 
and who can say how much of the tale was real? It is doubtful whether even the deceiver knew, for trickery had become so much a part of his existence that even he could no longer tell. Yet the words held sway over Sarek, who, like the ancestors before him, despaired of the divisions that were tearing his people apart. For long months he debated the matter with the other two pharaons of the Triarch and the nobles of the royal court. Through all of it, the only dissenting voice was that of Oricon, the court astrologer. This guy foretold that the alliance between the Necrontir and the Catan would bring about a renaissance of glory, but also destroy the soul of the Necrontir people. Yet, desire and ambition swiftly overrode caution, and Oricon's prophecy was dismissed. One year after the deceiver had presented his proposition, the Triarch agreed to the alliance, and so doomed their race forever. For their part, the Necrontir soon fell into awe of their discoveries, and the Catan moved to take control over their benefactors. The powers that the Catan manifested in the physical world were indeed almost godlike, and it was not long before the Catan were being worshipped as the star gods that the Necrontir had named them. Perhaps they had been tainted by the material universe they had become a part of, or perhaps this had always been their nature, even when they were bound to the suns that they fed upon. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you regarding the story of the Necrontir and the Catan for today. Next time, I will probably continue this story and tell you how this unfortunate race turned into the metal automatons they now are, and how they drove away even the old ones. What are your thoughts on the history of the Necrontir? Let me know in the comments below. Was this video enjoyable or informative? In that case, please consider clicking the like button and subscribing for more content. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all a peaceful day. The Emperor Protects.